Argrid Krupa Distinguished Chair Fund. The COVID-19 pandemic began more than a year ago and continues to this day with infections, hospitalizations, deaths, and lockdowns around the world. But there is a ray of hope fueled by the vaccines that offer the promise of eventually bringing COVID-19 under control. More than 25% of adults in the United States have received at least one shot. In COVID vaccines, fact versus fiction, we will sort through the misinformation and myths and bring you the truth about the COVID vaccines with the help of experts who can reflect on lessons we have learned one year later and identify what we need to do in the immediate future. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. The Health Channel is made possible by the continued leadership and generous support of the James I. Coddington Jr. Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation of Broward, the Kessler Family Foundation, and the Robel Family Foundation. Welcome to COVID Vaccines Ask the Experts, Fact versus Fiction. I'm Olga Villaverde. We are here to separate the truth from the misinformation and answer your questions about COVID vaccines and so much more. Tonight, I am co-hosting with Dr. Michael Zinner, CEO and Chief Medical Officer of the Miami Cancer Institute and a former Chief of Surgery at one of Harvard's medical school hospitals for more than 22 years. Good evening, Dr. Zinner. Thank you, Olga. <clears throat> a year ago, virtually none of us in the medical or public health profession imagined how serious this pandemic would be. We knew from experience that the potential was there for the devastation this past year has brought, but all hope for a short duration disease. We were wrong. We also knew from experience that a durable vaccine could be produced, but it might be years away. We were wrong again. Two decades of previous research catapulted a new technology into a workable, successful vaccine. And three and maybe four were available this year. That's an outstanding scientific and technological achievement. This past dark year has changed everything we ever did as a society. But now we have the ability to come out of it. We are on our way to vaccinating over 200 million Americans. But there's still doubts, there's still questions, there's still hesitancy. Tonight, we hope to answer your questions and make clear the vaccine facts versus fiction. Olga? Thank you, Dr. Zinner. Right now, I'd like to welcome our panel of experts. I'm going to start with Dr. Helene Gale. She is the CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's leading community foundations. She began her career as a physician and went into the public health and global development fields with the CDC and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome. We now go to Dr. Eric Goosby, a professor of medicine at the University of California at San Francisco and the director of the Center for Global Health Delivery, Diplomacy, Diplomacy and Economics at the Institute for Global Health Sciences. He was a member of President Biden's COVID Advisory Board and has had a leadership policy role in several presidential administrations. Welcome, sir. And finally, Dr. Carlos Del Rio. He serves as the Executive Associate Dean of Emory University School of Medicine and is the co-director and principal investigator of the Emory Center for AIDS Research. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Del Rio has been a leader nationally and locally doing research and developing policy. Dr. Zinner. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us. And we are all looking forward to a fascinating discussion. Olga. Dr. Zinner, millions of people around the world have been vaccinated, and there are still so many who anxiously want to be vaccinated, but there are a significant number of people who don't have access to these vaccines. So here is the first question tonight. How can we increase access to underserved communities? Dr. Zinner. Thanks, Olga. Dr. Goosby, I want to start with you. You saw how the underserved were treated during the AIDS crisis. And how can we increase the vaccine access in these underserved communities? 
Well, Dr. thank you, Dr. Zimmer. I think that we're in a position where the, it's critical for us to understand the population at risk, to understand how the virus itself, which we were just introduced to a little over a year ago, moves through the population. And if there are issues of special um, uh, vulnerability in different populations, and the COVID has shown us a spectrum of different uh, ability to, to impact different populations. That knowledge needs to go into the delivery system's ability to identify, enter, and connect to these populations. And you need to be aggressive in your surveillance data collection to sample all of those populations. Thank you. Uh, you know, let, let me move on. That Dr. Gale, uh, communities of color have had a deep distrust for medical for the medical establishment in the past. How can we counter that? Dr. Gale? Thanks for that question. And, um, you know, as you point out, the communities of color have uh, had a history of, of mistrust, but also we know during this pandemic that communities of color have been most disproportionately impacted by this. So, you know, clearly we need to figure out how we uh, connect the dots so that the communities that have been most impacted are able to access uh, the vaccines. You know, some of that mistrust uh, is well earned. It's come from a historical um, uh, a history of uh, unethical behavior, uh, mistreatment, discrimination within our healthcare system. And so there's a lot that needs to be repaired. But I think, you know, um, the best way to repair trust is by making promises and keeping those promises. So I think there's a lot that can be done during this pandemic that really helps to bridge that history of mistrust by making sure that we get to the communities, make vaccines accessible, and make sure that we're working with communities, engaging them directly, um, using messages and trusted messengers, working with community organizations, the faith community, and other uh, organizations that are trusted within communities of color so that we can repair that breach at a time when it's so critical. Dr. Gale, thank you. You know, in, in our community, we are we are reaching out to house, houses of worship and getting mobile units out to particularly the underserved communities. I think that's a critical point. Let me get Dr. Del Rio. It's not just the underserved. Studies show that there is a significant percent of 18 to 49 year olds who simply aren't interested in getting the vaccine. Now, that's their choice, of course but it keeps us from reaching herd immunity. Any thoughts or ideas about what we can do and how we can educate everyone about the benefits of vaccines? Dr. Del Rio. Thank you, Dr. Sinner. Uh, I think this is a really important point because in fact, you know, we first started rolling out vaccines by telling people this prevents you from, from dying, prevents you from hospitalization, from severe disease, which the vaccines do very effectively. But as you know, 80% of deaths of, of the tragic over 500,000 deaths in our country, 80% of them are people over 65. So young people frequently say, well, what's the benefit for me for vaccination? If, you know, if I get COVID, I'm not going to get very sick. Nothing is going to happen. And, and the reality is many of them are also concerned about, uh, you know, issues like what happens if I put this in my body? Will it impact my reproductive potential? Will it have cause infertility? So I think you have to do two things. Number one, we have to dispel the myths that these vaccines do not impact fertility, do not impact your reproduction. But number two, we also need to better explain the benefits of vaccination. And in my mind, as we're learning more and more about the, the power of these vaccines, we can explain better the benefit of vaccination. Recently, CDC said that if you're fully vaccinated, you can congregate in, 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 in close, you know, inside with a small group of also fully vaccinated individuals and not wear your mask. And I think that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Number two, you don't need to quarantine after you've been exposed if you're asymptomatic. And that, again, it's also a great benefit. But to me, the other benefit is what we learned recently is that these vaccines also appear to prevent you from getting infected and therefore from transmitting. And I think the, the value of that is if you're protected by the vaccine, then you're also protecting your community. And as you mentioned, you know, we use the term herd immunity. I like the, the term community immunity because you want to protect your community and your community, maybe your family, maybe your friends, maybe your loved ones, the people you, you live with, your dorm. 
But protecting your community is exactly how we're going to get out of this pandemic. So I think you appeal to that component. Great, great answer. Uh, I, I'm going to relate a little anecdote. Uh, over the past several months, uh, the highest rate of uh, hospitalization in our community was in the over 65 population. Over the last two months, that's gone down dramatically, and that is no longer the highest rate of hospitalization. Unfortunately, the highest rate of hospitalization for us is in that 18 to 49-year-old category, the, the ones that we're worried about not getting the vaccines, because we think the effect of over 65 may, in fact, be the effect of vaccines, at least in our state. Olga, let's move on. Let's do that, Dr. Zinner. Thank you so much. I have a question here, and it comes to us from Tom in Minnesota, and this is what he writes. New variants are providing challenges today, and yet several months ago, no one was saying the variants are coming. What is the next situation we know is coming, but no one is talking about? Dr. Zinner? Oh, thanks, Olga. Uh, let's talk about virus variants and, uh, and the mutations. Dr. Del Rio, I'm going to go back to you. How do we protect our communities from these dangerous mutations? Well, let's start saying that these viruses are RNA viruses. The uh, RNA viruses, when they, when they multiply, they tend to produce errors and they tend to produce what we call mutations or variants. And, uh, and the, so uh, the first thing is that as long as there's uncontrolled community transmission of the virus, you're going to see the development of variants. This is what viruses do. So the first thing we need to do is control transmission. And how do we do that? We do that with vaccines. We do that with, with mitigation strategies like masking, social distancing, avoiding crowded environments. But the other thing I wanna mention, and again, you're in South Florida, but really throughout the United States, but South Florida is particularly important, is that we are a global community. We're connected to the world. And we have to remember that one of the most effective regions in the world is Latin America. In fact, the worst epidemic probably right now is in Brazil. And a lot of those variants are coming from countries where the epidemic is uncontrolled. So just as, as important it is to control the epidemic in our community, it's important for us to, rec to control the epidemic in our larger community, i.e. our continent or even our world, because unless until everybody is safe, nobody's safe. We will continue to have things happening. So protecting ourselves is not sufficient. We cannot say, you know, America first. It has to be everybody gets protected because until we protect everybody, we're not protected. So controlling variants is going to require us to send vaccines and to allow countries like Brazil to have more access to vaccines so they can too control their epidemic and, and stop their variants. You know, that, I, I'm going to carry on that point. I'm going to actually ask Dr. Gale, you have had experience in this on the global scene. How do we make available to the globe the vaccines that we currently have either uh, either in this country or in Europe? Well, it's such a critical point because, as, as Dr. Del Rio said, uh, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And none of us, uh, you know, this pandemic won't be ended just by vaccinating Americans. We really have to think about the rest of the world. And, you know, there's a variety of different ways, which I think the United States is starting to step up. You know, one is uh, renewing, going back to its membership uh, with the World Health Organization to be part of the global community. U.S. has always been a leader in global health. It is critical that we continue that leadership role. People look to us for that. Uh, we've also contributed funds to COVAX, which is the global um, uh, vaccine unit um, that uh, is making vaccine available for the rest of the world. You know, we need to do more. We need to make sure that you know, we are getting vaccines to other countries at the same time as we're getting vaccines to our own population. It's not enough to wait until every American is vaccinated. Um, we've got to make sure that we're starting this effort now. You know, similar to what we did with uh, HIV and AIDS, where we really mounted a vigorous campaign, put re resources and dollars together because we knew that in a global pandemic, it is important that we're focusing on the, the whole world, the globe. Uh, so we need to do similar sort of efforts in this to make sure, uh, as, as was mentioned, that uh, these variants that are going to continue to occur, uh, that we're doing what we can to decrease that and degre decrease the spread globally. Well, I, I just wanna add a comment and all three of our panelists 
have had experience in that worldwide epidemic of AIDS and PETFAR, but the presidential uh, appointments to try to, in fact, deal with that on an international basis. So I want to thank you for that. And I think we've got lessons learned here about the same, same issues. So Olga, back to you. Next question. I just got a question in from Anne, and I find it to be very interesting. So here it is. I'm an 88-pound woman, and I have concerns about the same vaccination going into me as a 200-pound man. Is this safe? Dr. Zinner? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I relate to that on one side of the equation, but not the other. So, uh, But I am going to ask some of my panelists the answer on this one. So, Dr. Goosby, can you help us answer that question? Sure, that's a good question. Uh, I think that an 85-pound person uh, with other drugs really can run into difficulties if the drug dosage is too high. The uh, all of the vaccines are safely administered to people in that weight in that weight range. That's the answer. You do not need to be concerned about it uh, as long as there's uh, some uh, uh, that the consideration around putting it into the muscle itself would be something that you would really want to make sure that the injector really um, took some time to target. But I don't think you need to worry about that. And I would just add, you know, I think uh, people have to remember these, the trials for these vaccines were done in tens of thousands of people of all weights, all sizes, all races, all ethnicities. And so, you know, there's a lot of evidence on how safe they are, um, how they uh, function in different populations, different size people, all of those sort of things. So I think, you know, this is, these vaccines um, have some of the largest trials that we have seen. And I think we have good evidence about the safety in a range of different uh, sizes, shapes, colors, uh, and, uh, and geographies. That, yeah, great point. Thank you. All right, Olga, next question, please. All right, Dr. Zinner. Yes, we're going to Rio de Janeiro now, uh, Brazil from Dana. And she asks a great question, and I found a couple more, so I'm going to combine them because they're all kind of related. So here's the first one. Uh, based on the most up-to-date evidence regarding the use of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant women, is there any data demonstrating how safe they are? Uh, here's another related question from Sabrina in Illinois. Are the vaccines safe for breastfeeding women? And along those lines, let Let's add this one. Does the COVID vaccine have any effect on female fertility? Again, a few questions, Dr. Zinner, but kind of like on the same subject. Great. Um, I, I will just tell you, uh, the audience, that uh, I have a daughter-in-law who's an OBGYN in Boston. And when we talk, she tells me that's a question or questions she gets asked virtually every day. And I know there's new evidence on this. And I'm going to turn to Dr. Gale. Dr. Gale, can you begin to unpack that question for us? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it kind of relates to the question that I, uh, the answer that I gave earlier is that, you know, this, these vaccines have been um, tried very broadly. You know, in pregnant women, the vaccines weren't initially used in pregnant women because we always want to make sure that vaccines are really safe uh, in the broader population. But there were women within the trials who got pregnant during, during the trials, and we were able to look at the impact on pregnant women. So, you know, we know that they are safe. And we also know that COVID-19 uh, COVID can be more serious in pregnant women. And so it's actually important uh, to, to have that conversation with your doctor if you're pregnant, because getting COVID is likely to be worse for you than getting the vaccine for sure. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, that evidence is clear now, you know, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, and I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that, uh, Carlos, yeah. Dr. Del Rio. Uh, so I can tell you as an investigator in, in one of the phase three studies, the Moderna study, we enrolled some, a lot of women into the study. I wouldn't say a lot, but we enrolled some women into both that and the Pfizer study that weren't pregnant to begin with, but got pregnant during the, the, the clinical, the trial. And we follow them, and there were absolutely no problems. And furthermore, now CDC has data on over 10,000 women who have been immunized during pregnancy against with no with no problems. I can tell you personally, my 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 niece is pregnant, and I recommend that she gets vaccinated precisely for the reasons that Dr. Gale mentioned. And I would also say that my 
my my daughter-in-law is is breastfeeding. And again, I recommend that she lives in Miami and I recommend that she be vaccinated because she can actually, now we have very good data that that not only protects her, but actually the breast milk, she can pass antibodies to the baby through the breast milk. And there's very good evidence that that, that offers protection. So I can see a lot of benefits of vaccination. I really see no downturn from vaccination. What I tell people uh, if they're very concerned about it is do not get vaccinated in the first trimester, not because of not because of problems to the baby or or any issue like that, but because these vaccines are fairly reactogenic and you may get a fever, you may not feel well. And I don't want that to happen in the first trimester. But after the second, third trimester, absolutely get vaccinated. It is the right thing to do. And believe me, I've seen plenty of pregnant women in the hospital. In fact, I have one just about a month ago, a 32-year-old woman pregnant with very, very severe COVID. So I don't want to see that. Yeah, you know, there was a, th uh, Dr. Gooseby, there was a, a uh, there was a third part. Of, there was a third part of that that I, I wondered uh, whether one of the panelists, perhaps Dr. Kuzby, could answer. It was about fertility. Uh, can you answer that question about whether there's any uh, effect on female fertility? Yes, Dr. Zimmer. There, as uh, as Helene and Carlos really have already pointed out, there were concerns, uh, although rare events with pregnant women. Pregnant women who did get COVID had. Um, more uh, aggressive disease seen in small numbers of these women. Uh, Preterm birth uh, situations, some increased uh, preeclampsia, uh, clotting mechanisms were, uh, were also uh, thought to be associated. Looking further at pregnant women has not shown that there is an increased incidence of these. It's just that an individual may have a more rocky course. So I think the risk benefit strongly favors the woman with this. In terms of fertility, the term birth, uh, preterm birth question really raised that. And a number of groups, most of which I don't believe has been published, have looked at uh, fertility questions in populations that, as we've already said, have been picked up as the studies have continued. Globally, there are about 60 6,000 uh, pregnant women who have gotten both vac vac two doses of the vaccine, and they're being followed closely, both for the pregnancy itself, but also there's a cohort that will be followed post-pregnancy to see if subsequent pregnancies are impacted in any way. Right now, there's no reason to think that there is, but we are positioned to find it if it does show itself. Great. And I would just add to that, you know, I think there's been a lot of confusion about a, vi a vaccine that is a that has the word RNA in it. You know, and there's a lot of con concern about whether there's, you know, some genetic impact because it has, quote, genetic material. And, and again, you know, we know that there's nothing about the vaccine that gets incorporated into your DNA. There's no reason to worry about some of the things that I think, you know, people, because this was a new um, technique that was used for vaccine and because it had RNA and people think of that and DNA and thinking, is there some genetic uh, implication for that? Clearly there is none and there is no need to worry about fertility or uh, some genetic um, malformation as a result of this vaccine. Terrific. I know we get asked that question all the time, and I, I thank all three of the panelists for clearing that up. There is no genetic problem associated with any of the vaccines. Olga, let's move on. Let's do that, Dr. Zinner. Thank you so much. We have lots of questions to get to. This one comes from Mike in Washington State, and he wants to know the following. What is the expected duration of immunity from the vaccines? Dr. Zinner? Uh, you know, l let me just turn, uh, Dr. Del Rio, can you answer that? What do we expect in terms of the duration? You were a participant in one of the trials. What do you think we can expect? So the people, you know, Emory was one of the two sites that actually did the phase one study in Moderna. So those are the people when you, you take a very small group of participants just to see the dose and try to figure out the immunogenicity. And those people were immunized last March. So they're almost now a year out from their immunization and they still have good levels of immunity. So we don't know how long it's going to last, but I feel pretty confident to say at least a year because those 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 participants still have very good levels of immunity. Uh, you know, this is a new virus, so a lot of these questions, the answer has to be 
as of today, we know it's a year, but we'll know more later. You know, in six months, we'll say a different, we may say something totally different. I feel confident that this is not a short-lived immunity. Uh, that's great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, next question, Olga. Dr. Zinner, I just got one in from Ruth, and she writes, I've had a kidney transplant and have a compromised immune system. Should I take the vaccine? And I'm going to piggyback on that uh, with family and friends that I know that are right now battling cancer as well. Should they receive the vaccine? Dr. Zinner? Well, I'm going to answer that in part, and then I am going to ask the panelists. As, as uh, I had said earlier, I'm the CEO of a cancer institute, and so we deal with immunocompromised patients all the time. And like kidney transplant patients who are partially immunocompromised, we felt that a vaccine, even if it's not 100% as effective as if they were not immunocompromised, is better than nothing. So we are encouraging patients, and we are, in fact, actively in, uh, vaccinating patients here at the Miami Cancer Institute, specifically because they are partially immunocompromised. Let me turn to the panel and say, do any of you have advice on that to the general population? Nothing really... Uh... Go ahead, Helene. Please, Dr. I was just say, yeah, I would just gonna say, I would, I would agree. I think we always have to keep in mind that the disease is worse than the vaccine. I mean, the vaccine, um, there's, the disease is what we want to pr protect against. And so, you know, people who uh, are immunocompromised are in that category of people who we want to make sure that we're giving them all the protection that we can. I do think it is useful important for somebody who is immunocompromised. Dr. Goosby, but, but, I think you have to comment. We have to remember that, that there's no risk from the vaccine, but we may not see a good response in some immunocompromised patients. So the point to tell immunocompromised patients is you may not respond to the vaccine. You need to take extra precautions. And in fact, I'm dealing right now with a person who was in, fully immunized. This person is getting rituximab and now has COVID, symptomatic COVID, not very sick. But I'm not surprised. We checked the antibodies in this person, the immune status, and this person is not producing antibodies because, you know, rituximab wipe, wipes out your B cells. So it's not that surprising that that's the case. So we need to remember that just because you're immunized, because you are immunocompromised and some immunocompromising conditions may actually limit your response to the vaccine. So the vaccine may not be as protective as they will be in somebody else. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Olga, can we, uh, let's move on to the next question. We're trying to get as many as we can. Let's do that, Dr. Zinner. Thank you so much. This is uh, from someone in Miami. Her name is Marta. Thank you, Marta. She sent this question. She writes, I got my second shot and then I developed a sharp pain in my axilla underarm of the arm where I got the shot. I can relate to that. I think in the lymph node. After a few days, it's still there. Is there anything I should worry about? Dr. Zinner? Uh, Marta, you know, let me answer that question. The answer is no, there is nothing for you to worry about. That's your immune system reacting appropriately. Lymph nodes are the first stop in the immune activation. And yes, it will go away over time. And you did have an appropriate response. Olga, let's move on. Dr. Zinner, this is from Jeff in Atlanta. This is a great question. I know a lot of people have thought of this one. What percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to remove all indoor business restrictions? And then we're going to add the following question. When will we get back to normal? Dr. Zinner. Uh, that's such an important question that I'm going to ask all three panelists to make brief comments about it. Let me start with Dr. Del Rio and then Dr. Goosby and then Dr. Gale. You know, we talk about the word community immunity or herd immunity, and it depends on how 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 much uh, how easily that virus transmits. It depends on what we call the reproductive number of the virus. So, in the virus, in the in the original virus, we thought it would be maybe sixty to seventy percent. We know that some of the variants are more transmissible, so that actually may change that number. It may be higher even. So, it's really hard to really pinpoint how long will it take. I will say that with the experience we have is, for example, in countries like Israel that have vaccinated a large percent of their population, the number of new infections are actually dramatically coming down. So to talk about a percentage, I think it's, it's hard. I'm gonna, I can tell you it's a pretty high percentage. Right now, the good news in the US, we have about 20, 25% of the population vaccinated. 
The bad news is we still have about 80% or 70% of the population to vaccinate. So we're nowhere close to that number, even if you take into consideration those that, that have already had COVID. My, my thought is that it's going to take us more longer than what we think it is. And also, again, let's not forget about this, this issue that this is a global pandemic. And we may not necessarily get to that totally normal state. When people say, I want to be back to where we were before, I think it's going to, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be something that happens right away. This is not like a switch that you turn off. This is more like a faucet that you slowly start de decreasing the flow of water. Great. Dr. Goosby, then Dr. Gale. Thank you, Dr. Zimmer. I would just add that um, I think the uh, uh, concept of herd immunity, where you are able to have enough people uh, in the population who uh, are carrying protection, either from natural infection or from a vaccination, they are additive as you look at community spread activity in terms of the r not. But I do think that uh, the numbers of 60 to 75, which we really thought with the original wild type with the Wuhan virus, before we started to see the emergence of the variants, particularly the UK variant and the South African variant, um, our three vaccines are responsive to that and contain for severe disease and for hospitalization. So I believe we will be okay with that. But the variant, as Carlos brought up with Brazil, raises a the question of if there are variants that emerge that uh, have a stronger ability to infect and or are more virulent, those individuals uh, will change the ability for our community background protection to have the, the impact on these new variants as they emerge. Uh, it took six weeks for the UK variant to completely take over the island. And I think um, we are seeing UK expand, but we are not seeing it with the South Africa or Brazilian uh, variants. But that is the big unknown variable that will impact uh, where herd immunity, when herd immunity is reached. So it is a global uh, challenge. It's not just uh, in one city, one state, or one country. And in thinking about that protective component globally, we um, need to apply those same metrics. And that gets back to the availability of rapid vaccination. Great. Dr. Gale. Yeah, just a, a couple points. I, mean, I think um, one of the things that's also complicated is that, you know, we probably know more about um, how long immunity lasts from the vaccine than we do natural immunity because we just don't, we didn't have all the surveillance um, that would have been useful for us to be able to track who was infected. And, you know, we're still learning a lot about how long natural immunity takes. So if you've been infected, how long will you uh, still remain immune? So I think that adds uh, complexity to it. But I guess the other question about when will we get back to normal? I'm not sure that we will get back to what normal was before. I think there will be a new normal. You know, we will be living with COVID um, and, you know, we are likely to have other pandemics uh, over, you know, uh, the next few years. We knew that this pandemic was, or something like this uh, was very likely. And so I think we have to think differently about what is normal and how do we think about uh, continuing some of the same pr protective behaviors, you know, I think it should be normal in during flu season, for instance, for people if they get a cough or uh, feel like they have something coming on to put on a mask. Um, we should be thinking very differently about our behaviors, understanding that we are in a different world now than we were post uh, pre uh, COVID. And we've got to think about how we continue some of these same public health measures moving forward. Thank you. Olga, let's, let's move on. What's the next question? This is a big question for a lot of families who have their children in school. So the question is the following, and I hear it from so much of my friends as well. Schools are opening up. That's great news. But how can I be sure my kids are safe? Dr. Zinner. Thank you. Uh, we're fortunate tonight to have panelists from three different parts of the country. And because of that, I'm going to ask each one of them to make some comments about 
where they are. One, the, the West Coast, the central part of the country in Chicago, and then Atlanta on the East Coast. Now, it was an, a term was used a few minutes ago called R naught. I don't want to get into the weeds, but there are indicators of how disease and how prevalent a disease is in a community that gives us some index of how much transmission there is. So let me start with Dr. Goosby and then move on to Dr. Gale and then Dr. Del Rio about each part of the country you're in and what are the conditions there? Yes, uh, well, I'm in the West Coast in San, Northern California, San Francisco. We have been monitoring the outbreak for uh, six counties that touch the Bay. And there has been uh, a coordinated effort to understand um, the number of new cases, uh, hospitalizations, uh, those that are uh, uh, transferred to the ICU, and we were following um, uh, those that were intubated on, and uh, on ventilators, uh, and have gotten so our ability to predict uh, the delay from number of cases to hospitalization and deaths ultimately has gotten very uh, accurate. Um, we have decreased our infection rates now where we have about 35 infections a day in San Francisco and have moved to an aggressive posture uh, of opening, uh, reopening now, uh, just starting uh, last the end of last week uh, and will uh, pick up uh, as we move into next week for schools. Uh, the um, uh, spacing, the ventilation, uh, the number of students has all been looked at in the prior reopening attempts, and we are opening a spigot slowly to allow for these individuals uh, to come into place. Uh, the teachers have been uh, offered vaccine and the majority of them in the Bay Area have received it. Uh, and I believe that um, our surveillance uh, uh, is positioned to identify uh, flares or outbreaks. We have different strategies to deal with them when they occur uh, that um, uh, we will uh, bring to the um, larger Bay Area response that includes some ring vaccination uh, in outbreak settings that would lend themselves uh, to containment. Um, I believe that because of the um, less severe disease in children that uh, we have looked at the reopening of schools and how that will change or mitigate the risk for parents, teachers, et cetera, in spread in aggregate uh, communal settings, which many of our uh, population uh, live in. So, um, so we are moving aggressively forward. We're probably leading the other areas of the country. Dr. Gale? So, um, you know, a lot of similarities. Uh, unfortunately, we're starting to see some increases in Chicago and in Illinois. Um, you know, I think we're like so many other parts of the country where we're starting to see some upticks as I think people have relaxed some of the public health measures that, um, you know, people were more diligent about earlier on in this pandemic. So I think there's really uh, pause for concern. We're not out of the woods yet by any means. As far as the school situation, you know, we have reopen K through eight schools. Um, high schools will be reopened in another um, in another couple of weeks. Uh, and for the for the schools that have reopened, it's uh, on a hybrid schedule. And you know there are children who come in person and there are still children who are um, doing online learning. Only about 30 percent of uh, parents have actually elected, to send their children back to school. And I think it's one of the challenges as we do get our populations more vaccinated. And by the way, uh, we do have special sites for teachers. We've opened um, uh, in the city of Chicago, I think about uh, four or five sites that are just specifically to get teachers vaccinated. Um, you know, and, and the good news is, you know, we just got um, uh, data around children and the, and the vaccine. So, you know, hopefully before too long, perhaps in the fall or, uh, or around that time, 
children will start to be able to be vaccinated as well. And so, you know, there's a lot that I think will change, but I think, you know, we're still a bit gun shy. Uh, we've gone through this horrific year, a uh, lot of concern about in-person schooling. And so, you know, I think we are going through a transition period as, as parents get more comfortable about the safety of schools, as schools have been more um, able to outfit classrooms in a way that maintains safety, you know, children getting used to wearing masks during classes, all of those things are going to be important uh, as we really look at how do we reopen schools, you know, here in Chicago, just like so many places in this country, you know, we're really looking at learning loss in children and particularly in children that um, couldn't afford to be left further behind in terms of education. So it's a real serious issue and one that I think has been really troubling across the country. Thank you. And Dr. Del Rio, uh, any, any further comments? I would just say that, that opening schools, as, as President Biden said, is a priority. And it's a priority because we need those kids to be back in school, as, as Dr. Gale said. But we also, to open the economy, for parents to go back to work, we've got to get schools opening. And, and you know, the parents cannot continue being the teachers and, and doing all the other things they need to do. Uh, so uh, we know now there's data, there's nice studies showing that the risk in schools when, when mitigation strategies are put in place Actually, the transmission doesn't occur, you know, and we even know that you don't need six feet distance. There's some studies that in fully vaccinated schools, three feet of distance is enough. So I think between vaccines and what we're learning about the, 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 the risk in schools, I would say the risk in schools is fairly low. And if we get teachers vaccinated, we get employees vaccinated, we'll have vaccines for, for kids later on. I would say that we need to really do the right thing and open schools. I think that really is a priority. And I would go ahead, and if I have kids school age, I would start sending them back to school now. Great, great. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Olga, let's move on. What's the next question? Let's do it, Dr. Zinner. It comes in from Cheryl, and she is from New Jersey, and she writes the following. If you get COVID after getting the first shot, should you get the second dose? And let me add, when should you get the second dose? And I'd like to piggyback on that question with one I just received. This individual asks, should people who have had both doses of the vaccine be tested for COVID at any point in the future if they've been exposed? Dr. Zinner? Well, I'm going to just ask Dr. Goosby. Dr. Goosby, you want to make comments on both of the sets of that questions? Sure. Um, the uh, dosing for the vaccines, the MRA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, uh, have different intervals, but um, the uh, Pfizer's 21 days and the Moderna is 28 days. Um, they uh, are, um, they both should be taken. Uh, I know that there's been some, uh, a lot in the um, litter in the newspapers about the utility of one dose. Uh, the UK went ahead and uh, prolonged the administration of the second dose to try to get more people um, having received the first dose uh, to get more people under the curve because the effectiveness of the first dose is very high. Uh, and uh, it, uh, depending on the, there's been a couple of studies that have looked at 60 to uh, high 70% efficacy with the first dose after a seven day period to 14 day period. So very early on in small numbers, as we looked at more of those individuals with just one dose, it is clear that that second dose is needed, uh, but uh, prolonging it actually does not change the titer or the amount of antibody you generate. Uh, it, if anything, it gets a little more as you move out from the third to the fourth week, to the fifth week, to the sixth week even. So there's some um, uh, variation that you can give to that to uh, get different responses. But the answer is you should get the second dose. Uh, you should be sensitive to the interval, but if you aren't exactly on time, you should still return to get your second dose uh, and, not, and not miss it because there is a potentiation of protection. Um, and what was the second question for that? Well, no, I think you've answered the pr primarily okay. you've answered the question, which is around dosing and and you know, and you mentioned actually something I was going to bring up, which is the UK experience. They're going out three uh, months for the second dose yep. to get as many yep. people under. 
under the curve, as you said, and that's got up to 80% effectiveness, depending upon what trials you want. Olga, let's move on. What's the next question? The next question is from Sue in Ohio, and we thank her for this question. Um, I've heard it a lot, actually, and even I did this. I took Motrin when I went to go get vaccinated. Any issues taking Motrin or Aleve prior to the vaccine? Dr. Zinner. Sue, uh, you know, I'm going to take this one. The answer is don't do that. Uh, you can take it after the vaccine if you have symptoms. You actually want your immune system to kick in full throttle. Uh, and if you uh, develop a fever or body aches or something in the next 24 hours, it's perfectly reasonable to take Tylenol or Motrin or Aleve. But you want your system to really work. Olga, next question. All right, next question here is from Ray in Miami, and I think it's going to sound familiar to you, Dr. Zinner. She asks, would it be okay to host a maskless dinner party, maskless, where everyone there is vaccinated? The answer six weeks ago was no. What is the answer today? And I'd like to also add a question that I just received here. Do I need to wear a mask or more than a mask if I am vaccinated already? Dr. Zinner? I'm going to ask Dr. Gale. Dr. Gale, you were with the CDC. I, I think, and, and Olga's right, we had that question six weeks ago, and all of our panelists said, no, we're not ready for that. But now we are six weeks later. You want to share with us the new CDC guidelines on that? Um, you know, they're evolving all the time. Um, and, you know, um, the latest guidelines say that if you are with a group of people who are all vaccinated, it is um, safe to, to uh, you know, have a dinner party. I would just say for myself personally, I'm not having a, a dinner party with lots of people, even if they're all vaccinated. <laughs> you know, I still think uh, I want to give it a little bit of time. Uh, but, you know, the more we know, particularly now that we know that these vaccines also decrease your likelihood of acquiring or transmitting the infection, you know, I think we're becoming more comfortable with uh, people who are all vaccinated actually being able to be together in uh, social situations. Okay, I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we're not having any large dinner parties down here either, but we're having smaller ones with people that were kind of in our bubble, if you would describe it that way. Olga, next question. Uh, Dr. Zinner, I'm going to take this question from someone I just received. Uh, great response. It's from Eric, who says, and I'm quoting, I now believe I want to get vaccinated. So thank you very much. I also think I want to buy stock in COVID vaccines. Is that wrong? Dr. Zinner? I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to turn, I'm going to, turn to any one of the panelists who will be willing to answer that question. Oh, don't everybody well, answer know, at once. They, well, you know, I would say <laughs> I would have liked, I would have liked to buy Moderna. Whoever asked us what to invest in, yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I would exactly. have liked to buy Moderna vaccine, but I would have been accused, been accused for insider trading, <laughs> trading because I was. So, in fact, I have to I have to sign as an investigator a disclosure saying that I'm not buying stock in any of those companies. But, you know, it, if people did that, that's, that's their own decision. Talk to your investor advisor. Don't ask me. I'm not good at telling you what to do. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, we're the wrong people to come to for investment <laughs> advice. Yeah. And usually by the time, by the time you, you, you think about investing in something, it's probably already too late. But I am glad that the questioner said, now I'm willing to get a vaccine. I know. Good I, for, I, that, that's the, that's the important that. part. That's the important part. That. All right, and that's Olga. why I thought it was important to add that question because he said he was going to get vaccinated and that's what we want. <laughs> Thank but, you but so I, much, I, everyone. I would ask your speed, your, your, the person that sent the question, great, get vaccinated, but also take your buddies, get somebody else and tell, talk to somebody else about getting vaccinated. Because if you were convinced, help us convince others, people that get vaccinated need to become vaccine ambassadors to get others vaccinated. Yeah, and I would just I, I I would just add to that. You know, earlier on, you were talking about the proportion of over sixty five year olds and the acceptance rates. And I, you know, I do think that people who have seen others get vaccinated um, become the best in ambassadors, and they become believers. And I think as we see our friends and our neighbors and others get the vaccine, you know, that's the best endorsement that there is. So you know, I would totally agree. Get vaccinated. 
bring somebody else along, uh, convince a friend, convince a family member if they're having doubts. You know, I'm going to relate an anecdote just to that very question. When we started vaccinating in our facilities back in December, we had as many as 40 percent of our health care providers and forward looking individuals say they weren't sure or were really hesitant. Now, as the vaccines have uh, developed over the last couple of months, we're down to around 10 percent. So we are making progress even in our healthcare environment. And so, Dr. Yale, I think you're your comments are, are, all the panelists are, are dead on, absolutely dead on. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's go. Olga, next question. All right, Dr. Zitter, we have about five minutes left, and I want to get to these two questions. This one's really an important one. Interesting question from Puerto Rico, San Juan, and his name is Franco. He wants to know, how will all this vaccine data contribute to further research in developing cures and vaccines for other diseases? Dr. Zinner? Well, I'm going to ask the panelists on this, but I'm going to ask them to, to be brief if you can. And just as an introductory comment, this new messenger RNA technology from Pfizer and Moderna were not originally being developed for COVID vaccines. In fact, they were in development for over 20 years, looking at other diseases like malignancies and inflammatory diseases. So as I go around all three of the panelists, starting with Dr. Goosby, Dr. Gale, and Dr. Del Rio, can you make comments about where you think we are going with this new technology, realizing we only have a little bit of time left? Well, I, I would, um, it's a great question. Uh, I would say that the, how rapidly we were able to um, come up with uh, three approved vaccines in a year uh, really does uh, lend uh, itself to the kind of amazing investment that the United States and other countries in Europe mostly have invested in basic research that as Dr. Zimmer was saying, this fed right in to our ability to um, use it uh, for COVID. Uh, the messenger RNA uh, technology is innovative, it is uh, new, and it gave us the ability to um, take uh, what would normally take years to develop uh, an effective, safe vaccine. Uh, and we took out all the bureaucracy from it, but used numbers that were in the 30 to 40,000 uh, participant number range. So our confidence in safety is very high. That alone is going to open up a planoply of different opportunities from cancer uh, to infectious diseases to uh, anti-snake bite venom uh, remedies. It is, it is a huge portfolio that opens up with this technology. Dr. Gale and then Dr. Del Rio, briefly, please. Yeah, just, I would just add, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And I think that this platform does open up all sorts of um, new possibilities. I think the other thing, that this did was to highlight how important vaccines are. And vaccines have always been kind of the um, poor cousin of treatment. And I think this is opening up a new uh, uh, priority for, for vaccines and the wonderful way in which vaccines can prevent people from getting infections and diseases. So I think on both accounts, the fact that this is great technology that will allow us to do uh, a whole range of other infectious diseases, and the fact that we really uh, have elevated the importance of vaccines. And Dr. Del Rio. Uh, Dr. Senator, the only thing I would add is that I want to encourage viewers to understand why it's important to, to support research and why basic research is critical. When the research was done on mRNA technology, that nobody was saying, oh, in a few years we're going to have COVID, so we better work on this. And again, supporting the basic research that led to that technology is now paying off. Well, I, I want to thank, uh, thank you all. Uh, we, we just have time for one very, very quick final comments. And let me go, let me go on to my comments and as we wrap up this evening. Uh, it's been an amazing hour and great information has been transferred here. I just want to say thank you to all our panelists. We realize uh, what's happened uh, uh, this past year and we've seen dramatic changes that have occurred to our lives. And this evening gives us hope for what we see in the future, the ability to be vaccinated and for the responsibility of the individuals 
to get vaccinated not only for yourself, but for us and for society. So with that, I'm going to say good night. And Olga, thank you all for joining us. Olga. Thank you, Dr. Zinner. And as you said these words today at Miami Cancer Institute, please do your part, get vaccinated. We thank you for your time. I'm Olga Villaverde. Be safe, and we will see you next time. You take care. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. The Health Channel is made possible by the continued leadership and generous support of the James I. Coddington Jr. Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation of Broward, the Kessler Family Foundation, and the Robel Family Foundation. Support for this program is provided by Baptist Health through the John and Margaret Krupa Distinguished Chair Fund.